Welcome to the really useful podcast. Uh, I'm Christian Corley. I'm a tech writer from the UK. And with me is one of my colleagues, uh, Ben Stegner. Hello, everybody. I'm Ben. I am also a writer and an editor at Make Use Of, and I'm uh, happy to be here. Excellent. Now, uh, if you missed the the last issue, uh, last episode of the Really Useful Podcast. Uh, we are basically here to make tech work for you. That, that's, that's pretty much what it is. Uh, we're on camera this time as well as audio, so uh, you can uh, pick up a video version of this should you feel so inclined. Uh, we are, uh, I didn't mention this, Ben, we're actually on iTunes, we're on Spotify, we are on Google podcasts and there's five or six other services that are also available to be heard on i think stitch might be on might be one of them as well so that's in car stuff yeah we're everywhere if you, if you uh wherever you like <laughs> to listen we're there i listened to the first episode on spotify last week i think that was actually the first time i've ever listened to a podcast on spotify but it's nice though because you just you search for it it's right there yeah. you don't have to worry about keeping another tab open so lots of options i like that Excellent. Yes, yes it is. Okay, uh, now we are, I believe, going to be launching a Patreon, uh, which will allow anyone who wants to, to back this podcast and what we're doing with this. And, you know, the idea is that um, if you're a techie and you haven't got time to sort out your significant other's computer or your parents' computer or your sister or your brother or your kids or whatever, um, point them in our direction and, you know, we should be able to help them out through this podcast. This podcast is for non-techies. Uh, we right. write for non-techies, so you know, we're if you're not technically minded at all, this podcast is for you. Uh, so yeah, we um, we're going to be launching Patreon, so there'll be details about that uh, probably in the next podcast uh, next week. Uh, but just make you aware of that, and it'll be it'll be sorry, whatever you want to contribute, whatever you want to send us, uh, and we'll be able to use that to help pay for recording these. In this week's podcast, we're going to be looking at um, a particular news item, which is about Netflix becoming a data hog. Uh, then we're going to be looking at HDTV antennas and the fact that you can build your own, and they are very inexpensive. So if you are caught in a storm or anything like that and you want to watch TV or you need to watch TV because you're in a storm, uh, you don't have to worry about climbing on your roof. Uh, Ben's going to be talking about uh, CCleaner on Windows, which is a tool that can be used for uh, making more space on your computer uh, and whether you should still be using it or not. We're going to look at where you can find free online word processors. And we're going to tell you about the best Lego Star Wars toys because Christmas is coming. And, you know, it's Star Wars. It's some ideas. And it's Lego. Yeah, totally. So, uh, Let's crack on, and let. I think we better start with uh, the news and get the news bit out of the way. Um, sure. Netflix is the world's biggest data hog, which I don't know. It's so part of me does, isn't surprised by that. Yeah, I, I'm not. I don't. I don't think I, I'm say I'm surprised. Um, I think what was interesting um, that we talked about in that news article is that um, Netflix was the top, and second was um, like embedded videos, and YouTube was third. Um, which I actually found the most interesting that YouTube was not that far below Netflix, but it wasn't quite at the top. Um, I, I'm, I'm wondering if those embedded videos are just like Instagram stories or advertisements or that type of thing um, that takes that beats even YouTube. But yeah, I guess with Netflix, I, I was actually I wrote an article um, last week about how much data YouTube uses on average, and, and it seems like for the same quality video, Netflix uses way more data than YouTube, even if you're watching it 1080p or whatever. Right. Um, I guess it's just the compression, so yeah. it makes sense that YouTube would use less if it just uses less data all the time. But yeah, that's that's quite a bit of of 15% is huge. Yeah, it's massive, isn't it? Um... And if you consider what Netflix is widely used, but there's a lot of people not using Netflix. So imagine if it was even more popular, the impact that it would have. And they kind of, there is this tall um, scenario about, and it's gone through various names over the years, uh, about net neutrality and whether or not uh, the, the big companies, the big telecoms companies in the US and in the UK and Europe should be able to have, you know, this is, dual speed the internet and prioritize things and also charge customers for using Netflix when they're already being charged. Um, and th this 
I mean, I can see this being used to back that case up. Yeah, I think I've I've we've written about net neutrality before, and I think that it the, the like the knee jerk reaction of a lot of people is like, oh yeah, we have to have that because all traffic should be the same. And I, I agree to a point. I don't think that um, you know we should be charging people money just to go to Google or just to use whatever you know whatever browse whatever forums they want. Um, but when it's this much, you do have to start wondering like. Can, is it sustainable for mm. both home? I mean, we're talking about data, but for home internet companies and those on the road. I don't know about in, in the UK, but in the US, I think they still do it. T-Mobile, their thing for a long time was um, when you join T-Mobile. I think now they you get a free Netflix account, but I think for a while at least they were doing like that. You um, didn't your data didn't count if you were using Netflix. So you could watch as much Netflix or stream as much Spotify or Apple Music or whatever as you wanted, uh, and it wouldn't count towards your data. So that that sounds great, but I think what, when we see stuff like this, it's like when Netflix uses so much data, and it's just people don't, if they're on T-Mobile, they don't care how much data it uses. Yeah, T-Mobile. We we have a T-Mobile in the UK. Um, I'm not sure what the relationship between the two is. They're actually not called T-Mobile here anymore. They're called EE. Um, well, back in the day, they were called T-Mobile. And this isn't really anything to do with Netflix, but it is to do with data use. And what they would do, you signed up for your mobile account with T-Mobile. And at one stage, they had a massive, un- they had basically a super fast unlimited package. And you could then carry that along to your next phone and your next phone and your next phone. And I went through three or four phones having uh, this unlimited package, and then they ended the unlimited. And it was like crushing, crushing blow, you know? Yeah, when you get used to it, I think. So it was is it just it was just unlimited no matter what? Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. I think it seems to me that unlimited data has been kind of dwindling here. Um, I, I have Project 5 from Google, so I'm not quite as up on, like, the big cell carriers like Sprint and Verizon. But um, I don't see like TV ads for, for unlimited plans quite as much. I'm pretty sure Sprint still offers one, um, but I know they're, they're pretty expensive. Like I've looked at like T-Mobile plans just compared to what I'm paying for Project Fi, and they're, they're definitely not cheap. If you use them, it's worth it, but, yeah. Yeah. Uh, back to the story. Video as a whole accounts for 58% of traffic on the Internet. That's the downstream traffic. So that's a rise of 22% on the previous survey. And it beats web browsing into second place. So people are now using video more than they are using the internet. Oh, beg your pardon. People are now using the internet more for video than they are for browsing the web. Wow. Less reading, more watching. Uh, this article, um, along with everything else that we'll be talking about in this podcast, will be available in the show notes. Uh, so you can uh, go and uh, find out and read the details for yourself uh, at makeuseof.com. Now, we're going to move on to building a DIY HDTV antenna. Now, this is something that I tried uh, myself a few years ago using a great big plank of wood, 2x4, uh, eight metal coat hangers, uh, some uh, screws and washers, and I, I was amazed at how good the signal was, basically. <laughs> Uh, oh, there's two disposable barbecue grills attached to it as well. Uh, I mean, it looks like a complete lash-up, uh, but it works, and that's the thing. Now, I've been looking at this, uh, I've revisited this recently um, to find out. Uh, I knew there were some other ways of doing it, and I just got hold of one, which I would bring into the shop. But it's just out of reach, so I can't. I just got hold of a real one. It's a very compact little um, box, and I thought to myself, well, you know, this thing I made a while back was wood. This has come out of a factory. This is like quite compact. Uh, can it actually get any smaller? So I've looked into this, and it turns out that, yes, it can get smaller. HDTV antenna can get smaller. Um, there's different ways of doing it. it. And, you know, you can ch- check the link uh, for the details. But we're talking about card and foil and bits of glue, um, then wires and the attachments of the coaxial cable, uh, which... Uh, is a kind of uh, important aspect of it, but you don't necessarily have to have that because you just run the coaxial cable, um, strip it, and use the internal core and the external bit and attach those to it. But after saying all of that, it turns out that you don't even need to do that because if you are fortunate enough to live in the right areas, you can attach 
a paper clip that has been unwound, unwound into an L shape like that. Attach that with a short end into the back of your TV. And that is all that is needed. Now, it does depend on your range and weather uh, between yourself and the transmitter. But that, I mean, that's amazing that yeah. we're at this stage now that that will work. Yeah, to be able to pick it up with that like tiny little paper clip, it's just like a random piece of scrap sitting around your house. To be able yeah. to pick up a signal from that is really cool and a good option if you don't, you know, you don't you don't want to put an antenna on your roof or you just recently canceled cable or anything like the article talks about. Yeah, I think probably the best way to do it, although you could put it back straight back in the the TV. I think the, probably the best way to do it is to run an extension up to some elevated point, maybe um, your, your loft space. Sure. Uh, space, whatever, and then uh, plug it into the end of there. But uh, you know, when um, digital TV first came along, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it's the same in the US as it was over here. Uh, you know, it was a weaker signal than the uh, the analog signal, so it would be a lot harder. And obviously, you need to convert it, but it would be a lot trickier to get a good, strong signal without quite a large antenna. Well, now the analog signal's been switched off here in the UK, more, more or less switched off. There's small pockets where it's still used, but it's more or less gone. And the digital TV signal is now stronger. Uh, you know, these things work. Yeah, it, it, I want to say it was the same here. Um, I I don't think I, we had an analog TV at that time, so I don't... I, I remember the transition because I remember like my grandparents and a few other people that were using just a, a standard antenna. I think if you didn't switch over, it would just broadcast a message like you need to do this. But mm. yeah, it's, I mean, it's if you if you have an old TV that you're not using for anything else, it, just a little fun little side project. If nothing else, stick a paper clip in. <laughs> yeah. yeah, see what happens. Uh, be careful, and obviously make sure you're attaching it to the right place. Right. Yeah. Uh, Safety first. Safety first, absolutely. It actually you reminded me of um, the, the switchover thing. Now, I had uh, a relative who lived in a small cottage, and basically they had a valley right in front of them, a hill behind them, and then at the other side of the valley, a hill. And here in the UK, up until 1982, we only had three terrestrial channels. And oh, okay. because there was no satellite and no cable, we had three channels. Uh, and uh, my uncle could not receive the fourth channel that launched in 1982 because of where they were based. And this, as far as I know, is still the case today. Uh, without uh, satellite TV, they wouldn't be able to re re receive that fourth terrestrial channel, which now streams to on satellites uh, or whatever. So uh, landscape is an important part of terrestrial, whether it's digital or analog. Uh, so, you know, it really does depend on how far you are from the antenna and your location, whether or not that paper clip will work. But the, you know, the other solutions outlined in that article, we have a, a card and foil solution and a fractal antenna, which is basically, I mean, that's foil again, but with a different design and attached to a piece of, uh, sort of flexible transparent plastic. And of course, my own, uh, attempts, uh, which I found online and, uh, I had to go myself the, uh, an the coat hanger antenna as we call it. Uh, yeah, that's worth doing as well. Um, so please have a look at that link if you're interested in uh, getting yourself a low-budget HDTV antenna, antenna, or as I say, if something has happened to your own antenna and you need to get uh, TV. Uh, I um, I don't live in a stormy area, Ben. So, I mean, is TV something that's important during storms for communications, or can you get away with radio? Um, I would say TV's not, like, vital. I mean, it's definitely a good option to have. I know we have, like, little emergency radios you can buy that'll just broadcast, like, you can listen to the weather. It's like a slider. One slider is the weather, and the other one's, like, an emergency broadcast. So, um, I mean, I would imagine where I live, there's not a lot of, not a lot of, like, natural disaster potential. Like, we don't get hurricanes, no earthquakes, and probably floods would be the only thing. So I think TV would definitely be a suitable option, but I don't think it would be, like, absolutely vital. Okay. Um, I think we've all heard of people who have attempted to repair aerials in storms, though, haven't we? Oh, yeah. And um, obviously it's not gone well. In fact, there was a, there was a famous entertainer. You won't, probably won't be aware of him because I don't think he was famous in the U.S. Um, a guy called uh, Rod Hull. And uh, he died... Um, basically, his his um, his his uh, what we call turn 
was a he had a, a dummy emu, which is basically his arm was in the neck of this emu, and okay. then he had a false arm going over the side of the emu. So he'd run around kind of the emu, and the emu would basically assault people. That's what it was. It was basically it was all about the emu assaulting people. And, you know, you think, oh, that's not particularly funny. But um, the, the guy has such a good manner about him. It was, it just turned it. It was hilarious. Uh, for, <laughs> at his time, anyway. It's on YouTube. Go and have a look at it. It's funny. But um, this guy, who's a famous guy, um, went onto his roof during a football match, during a World Cup match uh, that England were playing in, and died trying to fix his aerial. Wow. So, yeah. So, yeah, not, not good. So, yeah, it's... Um, Safety first, definitely. And use the paperclip. If you can get away with the paperclip, use the paperclip. Uh, let us move on then, because uh, you um, have a few things to tell us about sea cleaner, don't you? Which is something that uh, people have been using for a lot of years to keep windows tidy. Sure. Yeah, so CCleaner, if you're not aware, uh, CCleaner is a really popular software that's been around for Windows for probably 10 years now. Um, it's, it used to be called Crap Cleaner. Um, basically what it's for is just cleaning up junk files on your computer. Um, so Windows has a lot of this stuff built in, but CCleaner was always praised because uh, it cleaned some spots that Windows wouldn't clean. Uh, it would do a lot quickly, um, and it had some other small features, like it had a disk space analyzer and some other tools like that. So it's one of those tools that we would always... Uh, not hesitate to recommend because it was just so, you know, you, you need to clean your computer, you see cleaner, it's just what you do. So um, over the past year or so, and particularly in the last couple months, Sea Cleaners had a couple of big problems that have led me and a lot of other people to say that you probably shouldn't be using it anymore. So um, the the first problem was uh, last year, uh, one of the versions of Sea Cleaner, it was a 32-bit version, so um, thankfully it wasn't everyone using it, um, but that version was hacked uh, to distribute some malware when people were downloading it, and um, CCleaner, or Piriform, who owns CCleaner, wasn't actually aware of that uh, for some time, so um, it was distributing malware for a while, so thankfully they cleaned that up, but, but the shady thing, not the shady thing, but the, the shame of that is um, about a year and a half ago, I want to say, in like July 2017, uh, Avast, the major antivirus company, purchased Piriform. So uh, they've been running the show with CCleaner uh, for, for quite a bit now. So it's kind of a shame that you know a, a renowned security company is allowing their, I mean, hacks happen, but that their product's getting hacked and it's distributing malware for that amount of time. So that was the first thing. Uh, and then CCleaner ran into some other problems where one of the new versions it came out with included a new uh, monitoring feature, which was just kind of slipped in there without much notice to the user. Um, but the shady thing with that was when you, if you unchecked it and said, no, I don't want to, I don't consent to you collecting information about how I use the, my, my computer and how I use this software, whenever you closed CCleaner or you rebooted your PC, it would automatically re-enable that option. And for some reason, they made it harder to quit the software, too. So when you click the X on the window, uh, it wouldn't close the software. It would just minimize it and made it a lot harder to close for, for the average user. So um, CCleaner's just been doing a lot of shady stuff lately. The most recent one was that they were forcing people to update. Um, even if you said, no, I don't want to install the latest update, it would just do it for you. So um, it's a shame because we used to recommend this tool a lot, yeah. but um, it's turned into a lot of the stuff it's been doing is like – malware behavior, which obviously we don't want you to have on your computer. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's always, it's always sad to see long time software that's popular like that kind of go down the drain. So if someone's going to get rid of CCleaner, which seems like a good idea now, what's the alternative? So the, uh, the main, I talk about the alternatives in depth in the article if you, if you want to read more information there. Um, but for most people, I would just recommend using a, a set of built-in tools in Windows, um, like which again are detailed there. So Windows has its own, um, disk cleaner, which will clean up, you know, junk files or uh, error logs, that type of thing that you don't need, um, after you've dealt with them. Um, it has that built-in, um, Windows can also clear caches, so you know you can clear your browser cache um, right through the browser interface. You don't need CCleaner to do that. Um, and then a lot of other tools that CCleaner had, you can replace with other tools. So you can install um, a tool that shows you what's taking up space on your system. Uh, you can install uh, 
tools that tell you uh, how much space programs are taking up, um, what start, what's running at startup. All, a lot of that stuff is built into Windows, um, and you don't need CCleaner for it. And CCleaner's other big feature that a lot of people talk about is the registry cleaner. Um, we've talked about it at the site before. Registry cleaners are just not worth your time. Um, even if you cleared up thousands of errors, it's not going to improve performance in any uh, meaningful way. So definitely don't need to run the registry cleaner and CCleaner. So, yeah, just getting familiar with some of Windows built-in tools um, is, is definitely a good option. There are other, there are other alternatives, like uh, BleachBit is an alternative you can use that's like CCleaner, but it hasn't had these problems. But um, for most people, you probably don't need to be uh, using those type of cleaners when the built-in tools suffice. Okay, great advice there. Uh, now, it is that time of year when people start going to school and college and university and... Uh, Doing assignments, and in most cases, you've probably got something to type on, uh, a word processor of some type, but what if you don't? Now, uh, one of the Make You Stop writers, Akshata Shambak, has looked at what is available in terms of free online tools for word processing. There's some good suggestions in here. Uh, there's some that you maybe don't know about as well. Uh, alongside Microsoft Word, which comes in various uh, free online forms, you might have it on a mobile device, probably free on a mobile. You can get it uh, through your browser as well, using Office Online. Um, and then there's Google Docs as well, again, a free tool. Uh, then there are cloud tools like Zoho Writer, uh, which is part of the Zoho uh, Cloud, and... The other one is Dropbox Paper, which I didn't know. Have you heard of Dropbox Paper? Though? I think I've heard of it, but I don't know if I've ever used it myself. It's one of those things where, like, you're signed up for Dropbox's emails, and, like, you get those emails about new product features. So I've seen the name. I don't think I've ever used it much. But, it's, yeah, another, another good reason to use Dropbox, I guess. Yeah. There's also Only Office, which is an open-source uh, cloud-based uh, system, which you can also use. And there's a tool called Writer, which is very plain text and has uh, has a markdown support if you need that. But it's also very traditional because uh, it gives you a green screen approach. So if you were if you found you were writing more 30 years ago than you are now, that might be uh, something that you uh, that you find. What do you use for writing, Ben? Uh, so I use an app called uh, Carrot to write in Markdown on my computer. I used to use uh, an app called Markdown Pad, uh, which was actually created by a former Make Use Of writer from many years ago. But um, that app is not really supported anymore. I mean, it still works, but it hasn't seen updates in a while. Um, kind of some rough edges starting to pop up, you know. So um, I switched to Carrot, which is it's pretty nice. It has a nice uh, visual uh, look to it. It's pretty simple. Um, it's, I think it's in beta, so the developers have been uh, kind of, you know, crafting it as it goes, and I've sent some feedback about some some things I'd like to see change. But overall, it's a nice app. So I just write in that, and then I just yeah. copy the, uh, the HTML and put it in WordPress. But Does it have a spell check? It does, yeah. Actually, it was getting it had a problem where it was getting stuck for a while, but they fixed that. But yeah, I, I always need spell check because I I tend to, you know, just to make dumb errors and things like that. But yeah, it's pretty slick. I'm, it's it's on Windows and Mac. I'm not sure if it's on Linux, but there are a lot of Markdown writers like that. I know there's one called Typora that a lot of people are using now. That's also in beta. Writing apps are one of those things where I. Like when I open my writing app, I know it's time to work, so I want to get used to it. So I don't, I don't, I try not to switch if I can help it, but I'm always interested to see what else is out there. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I just use Word all the time, basically, uh, pretty much exclusively, other than the Word, other than WordPress itself. I think I started writing in Word um, when I first started writing at the site, and then someone told me that when you use Word, it as a lot of like junk HTML and stuff. So yeah. I figured that I should start using WordPress. I think I wrote a couple articles in Word and then kind of taught myself Markdown. I, I don't mind writing in WordPress. I edit in WordPress, but I find that when I write in WordPress, I get worried about something uh, freezing or something like that. So I just try sure, to avoid sure. it. I wrote my very first, well, not my very first, that's a lie, but the last assignments, certainly the last assignment I did for my A-level English, uh, a good 
20 plus years ago, that was written on Microsoft Word and I'm still using it now. So <laughs> maybe I'm fond of it. I don't know. Uh, so yeah, so there are plenty of opportunities, um, plenty of options for writing in an online word processor. There are free options that you can download as well, which we'll maybe look at another time. We, uh, we're doing okay for time. Uh, I think it's probably now is a good time to ask you about your striking earphones. Headphones. Oh, yeah, they're, aren't they beautiful? Uh, yeah, so if you're watching the video, you can see, uh, and if not, I can explain. So uh, I bought a new pair of, of headphones um, about a week and a half ago. I bought the uh, Hyper X Cloud Alphas after watching some videos and reviews. I wanted a headset I could use on my PS4 and on my computer um, that would also be good for just music and that kind of thing. So I was happy with them. I think they, they, they look good, they feel good, they sound good, but um, I ran into an issue where the left... My left ear was hurting after wearing them for like a short time, um, almost like a weight was like resting on your head while you were sleeping, kind of thing. It's weird. Like it, I don't know. I almost felt like my my bone hurt. So I looked into it and saw that there were some issues where other people had the same problem. How I didn't see those before I bought them, I don't know. Um, but I ended up buying these new ear cups that are a red velour. I don't know if you can see them, but they're like a almost like a a seat at a theater material instead of that like memory Whoa. foam. So, yeah, they're nice. The, the headphones are red on the side, so it matches that. Um, but getting them on was a huge pain. Um, so if you if you were listening and you are thinking about swapping out your, your headphone ear cups, just know that it might depend on your headphones. Maybe these are harder. But um, when you buy replacement ones, they have like a thin layer of fabric around them in a circle, and you have to tuck that fabric in a really small gap and pull it the whole way around, and it's really easy for it to slip, and then you got to start all over. So it took me a bit, but I'm, I'm happy with them now, and I can wear them without having them hurt my ears. So That's it's a good, in, good investment. But, yeah, I think they look good. And, they, I mean, that, I, I figured I'd try the velour for something different because I'm fine with the memory foam, but these are thicker, which is what prevents the, the ear pain. So I think it's important as well to note that um – if you've got a pair of earphones that are maybe not as comfortable, you can change change the phone bits. But also, if the phone bits seem to be deteriorating, you can change the phone bits. Right. Uh, these which is these ones I feel like I need to do, to be honest. These ones that I bought, yeah, they're, I forget the name of them, Danger X or something. Um, that's not it. Danger Bits, something. Um, they're, I think they're pretty much universal. Like they, they make round ones for those type of headphones, and then like oval ones. These are over ear. If you if you had ones that rested on your your ears, you need a different type. But yeah, I think a lot of people. That's the first thing to go on headphones, especially if you have stubble on your face, you know, and it's like tearing up the foam, that type of thing. So it can be if you select like your headphones, it's a good way to. Uh, to extend the life of them without replacing the whole set. Sure. Okay, let's move on to the final exciting item. Uh, you may be aware, Ben, of a film series called Star Wars. I think I might have heard of it once or twice. Saw a commercial or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, um, I, I actually just saw Solo myself for the first time a few weeks ago. I haven't seen that one yet. You haven't seen it's it. Good? I was, no. I was um, pleasantly surprised. Okay. It that way, I was a little bit doubtful f- uh, regarding the actual point of having the movie, but uh, I it, I certainly enjoyed it. I wouldn't. It's not like I'd ask for the time back. It was good enough to uh, to watch. So yeah, it's oh, good. Yeah. It's good enough for most movies. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. There are a lot of Star Wars Lego toys. This has been going on uh, for the best part of the 21st century to date. That. Uh, Lego teamed up with Star Wars, uh, revived Lego as a toy, and did a lot of good for the Star Wars toy franchise as well. Uh, Especially in an age where a lot of toys are available in so many different formats, it's quite good to have one, to have something that is quite consistent within itself in terms of Lego. Uh, You know, you can get like 8 inch Star Wars toys, you can get 12 inch Star Wars toys, you you know, you can get like Darth Vader's that are that big. Um, but having that just that standardized Lego size um, is, is kind of cool. Now, there are, um, we reckon there's 10, like, well, I'll say we, I reckon there are 10 <laughs> Lego Star Wars toys that are actually worth buying right now, today. And, you know, Christmas is coming. These toys are not going to be around forever. I've recently updated my list because Star Wars toys are taken uh, Lego toys are discontinued. Uh, this fella behind me here. 
if it's not already discontinued, it soon will be. My VW Camper. Um, the same is true of the Star Wars toys. Now you probably know that um, Lego, large Lego sets in particular, are worth quite a bit of money. They do. Um, they get the very least maintain their purchase value. Sure. Song, which is really good. Uh, indeed, um, little anecdote for you. Uh, around 15 years ago, not quite 15 years ago, I'm just rounding, uh, I got married and uh, one of the things we did to raise money for our wedding was to sell my old Lego. Oh, okay. And um, it's a bit sad now. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it was um, mostly Lego space packages and a an old Lego train set, and they sold for around the same that they were purchased for. And, you know, we were trying to pay for people's uh, meals at the wedding, so, you know, they, they paid for 10 or 11 people to eat at the wedding, so, you yeah, know. Yeah, that's, that's pretty clever. It, it is it is funny, too, because I feel like a lot of toys, I guess it depends on the toy, because I guess some toys are, like, about a specific show or brand that might not be hot you know if you buy it about something like the kids show that's on today five years from now no one even knows what it is so i, but I guess lego are like consistently like you can rebuild them or you can just use the pieces for your own creation maybe that's why they they hold their value yeah 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 probably is that um so yeah as i said there's there's 10 and you know i'm not going to go through all of them but i am going to tell you that you know there's, there's a there's a list that you can view it's in the show notes um, head over to make use of and have a look at this list of Star Wars toys, which you need, if you know, if anyone in your life loves Star Wars and love Lego, and Christmas is approaching, you know, it's October now, so it's good to be prepared early. There is an absolutely gorgeous Lego Star Wars snow speeder from Empire Strikes Back, uh, which is a recent addition. Uh, it is not cheap, but, you know, there are sales coming along. There's Black Friday and all that sort of thing. So it's, it's worth keeping an eye out on that one. There is also, and this is probably the other big thing that I would mention, there's a First Order Star Destroyer from Star Wars 8, uh, which is the most recent trilogy movie. And it's basically, it's a huge Star Destroyer that opens up. And there's, you know, there's, there's a, a bridge, uh, there's a room for uh, Supreme Leader Snoke. It's, again, it's not a cheap one. But it is absolutely stunning. If you're looking for something that is a bit more budget friendly, then to be honest with you, the Force Awakens Lego Star Wars game is probably the best place to go there. Because uh, it's just a lot of fun. Uh, are you a fan of Lego Star Wars games, Spence? I know you're a gamer. Yeah, um, I'm not, I never had too many, well, Lego, like Star Wars Legos growing up. I had like an ATST. Um, but I never had like a ton of them. Like I, a couple of my friends had like the Millennium Falcon that were a lot more impressive. Um, the games, yeah, I had, um, I had the first two. So the first Lego Star Wars game was the prequels and the second yeah. game was the original trilogy. So yeah, I had a lot of fun with both of those. That was actually, I think I might have played those before I saw the movies, um, when I was younger. So it was, it was a lot of fun wow. to, to, to go through and it, it's, they're pretty faithful. I mean, in, you know, Lego form. Um, but yeah, they're, they're cool games. They take you to different locations and there's a ton of different playable characters and it's fun multiplayer too. Cause you can drop yeah. in or out at any time. So yeah, I haven't played the, I haven't played any, any of them past those early ones, but if they're as high quality, I'm sure that the, the new ones are really fun too. Good. The Force Awakens was good. Um, but there's a lot of humor in them as well, isn't there? Yeah. So yeah. even if you're finding yourself getting frustrated, there's something going on that you can just mess about with for a few minutes to calm it down and try again. Right. The, even like that with the main story, there's a lot of like Lego, like people getting their arm pulled off or just, yeah. just like, like Lego jokes that wouldn't make sense in any other form. Yeah. They're, they're definitely fun games. That's a, it's a good like parent kid game because it's not like super yeah. demanding. Yeah. I'd agree with that. I played, um, I played the original, I don't know what's it called. So I call the original trilogy the the, um, the the combination pack of the the first uh, three the complete films. saga complete I saga think. yeah yeah on the way with my boy and um, yeah we we spent hours and hours and hours playing that and it's a lot of fun yeah uh, so yeah there are Lego toys and you know if you love Lego it's a massive toy brand Christmas is coming um, do take a look at that list for some suggestions um, they're not all two hundred dollars uh, it's the big ones that are you know, the expensive ones. But there's some uh, stunning stunning builds on there that are uh, worth checking out. Because, as I say, uh, if you've got one eye on uh, how these things are going to uh, accumulate or duplicate in value, 
over the years, then uh, these are the ones really to be keeping an eye on because they are the ones that are going to be withdrawn sooner rather than later. Now, we're, we've, uh, we've reached that stage of the Really Useful Podcast once again where it's, uh, we're very close to saying goodbye. As I mentioned earlier, we are available on iTunes, we're available on Spotify, and we can be listened to through Google Podcasts. We also have a, a Patreon set up in the next few days uh, in order for you to support us. Uh, anything that you can uh, back us with from there, that would be great. Uh, full details of that will uh, transpire probably in time for the next podcast. Uh, if you have any queries that you any help that you need any questions about technology then get in touch with us uh, and uh, we can build a sh- we can build an entire podcast around it potentially um yeah. that you know that is what we're here for we're here to make tech easier for you guys there is a lot of stuff going on in the world when it comes to computers and mobile phones and the internet and facebook what's facebook doing with privacy we looked at that in the last podcast but it's it's an ongoing thing it's not going to go away uh, in the foreseeable future, as long as we're connected in the way that we are today. We're trying to make it easier for you to get online and get done what you need to do without worrying about the privacy, without worrying about whether something needs to be installed, whether something needs to be uninstalled, what these things even mean. You probably don't need, don't want to know that, and you probably need to know the absolute bare minimum of that. We're going to fix that for you, so get in touch with us with any questions that you have. And uh, we will sort that out, potentially, as I say, build a show around it, certainly address your questions. I'd like to thank my colleague, Ben Stegner, for joining me uh, for this week's really useful podcast. Uh, Myself and another member of our team will be back next week. Um, Do listen to us. Do share us with as many people as you can. Give them the clues that they need, the answers that they need. And uh, we'll see you again. Bye-bye. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.